Hi everyone and welcome to the next couple of segments of the keratopigmentation related surgeries. We're going to discuss in this series a few surgeries which was done before keratopigmentation and about potential surgeries which could be done after. Okay, the first thing we're going to discuss is that where uh, the color, the pigment which we're inserting in the eye is located. As I told you, it's inside of the cornea. So if you will see about the half depth of the cornea, there is the color which is inserted. Now imagine that before this surgery, you did have LASIK or someone had LASIK. You have flap, which is basically a plane of separation of the cornea, about 100 microns. This is about 250 microns, but still there is a plane of separation here. And if you look from the front, Basically, the whole thing of this, it's a flap of separation. Basically, flap is lifted up when you do LASIK and then placed it back. So the color would be under this flap. But because the distance between the two is relatively short, some of the cases when you really did have refractive surgery would be impossible to do the color change because of possible coalescence of the channel with the pigment with the plane of separation of the LASIK. Why is that? Because when you introduce the color and if it's coalesced one to another, the pigment can get inside of the central of the cornea and then may decrease your vision. That's why cases of the uh, LASIK cannot be in advanced 100% sure that you can do pigment change. Sometimes it will require still the creation of the channel. And if the channel under microscope is not coalescing to the plane of separation, you still can do the pigmentation, but sometimes it does. And we will have to stop the surgery, which is not going to lead on, on to any problems with the vision, because if you will see the separation of the flap coalescing with the separation of the channel, we're going to just stop the surgery. Next morning, you're not going to even know that we did the flap, I mean the channel, but the insertion of the, of the pigment, if there is this, the coalescence of, of these two planes may be dangerous. That's why in uh, previously uh, performed surgeries, you cannot say 100% that you can or cannot do the surgery. Let's start from the young people who didn't have any surgery before and would like to have keratopigmentation. What happens if afterwards, like after 20 years or 30 years, they will need to remove the cataract, for instance? You already have pigment in the cornea which limits the size of your pupil to usually 5.5 millimeters, which is enough for cataract surgery or any other intraocular surgery uh, to be performed. Uh, what is gonna happen in this situation, the entrance uh, to the uh, eye where the cataract is location, located would be through the peripheral part of the cornea, let's say from this area then uh, you will need to do all the surgery inside of this fixed pupil, which is actually represented by the pigmentation within the cornea. As I told you, the size of the uh, artificial pupil, which is this, enough for to perform the surgery. That's the first scenario. Second scenario is when you already did have cataract surgery or someone did have cataract surgery. So the cataract is removed through this type of incision, an incision approximately here. So we're gonna create the channel just in front of this uh, opening and we'll fill it with the pigment. Sometimes the uh, length of the initial incision for the cataract is a little bit further away. Then that's the area which we need really to be very careful because as you see, the, uh, the incision for the cataract is stepwise. Now we're gonna take a look on a special machine where this specifically, how deep is located, and we're not gonna to touch with the uh, channel, the area of opening on the cornea. So that way we're gonna prevent penetration of the pigment outside or inside of the eye. One important thing would be to discuss uh, the possibility of glaucoma. That's gonna be in the next segment of the lecture.
One of the most common diseases of the eye is glaucoma. There are two types of that. It's a narrow angle glaucoma and open angle glaucoma. This is the cornea and the sclera. This is the iris. And this is a distance between the iris and the, and the cornea. So it's very narrow if you compare it to this one. Green line signify the flow of the fluid. The fluid comes from here into the angle and gets out from the eye. In this situation, sometimes the, it's the angle is so narrow that uh, the fluid cannot reach it. That uh, leads to acute attack of glaucoma. In order to prevent it, laser beam is uh, directed to the iris when it does specific work which opens up the angle. In the open angle glaucoma, the block for the outflow is the angle itself. So the lasers are, are aimed to this specific area. So now coming back to the uh, keratopigmentation. If we're going to put the pigment inside of the cornea here or here, the laser beam would be more difficult to reach the area which is necessary for the treatment. That's why when we do the first consultation, we're almost paying attention to the situation with the anatomy of the angle and also with the intraocular pressure. If it's suggestive that the possibility of glaucoma, uh, if it's a narrow angle, we do prophylactic laser uh, treatment here. If it's a glaucoma itself, we do prophylactic laser here. Also, as you know, the uh, glaucoma could be treated by the drops. But nevertheless, in the first consultation, we want to make sure that there is no disease in the eyes. And as you see, before doing any keratopigmentation, as I told you, it's located here. We're going to make sure that there is no danger for the next years or tens of years of development of glaucoma. And that's why we do prophylactic treatment. On this drawing, you can see the, uh, again, the element of the eye. It's a cross-section of the eye. Cornea, iris, pupil, lens. And that would be the vitreous. That's where very often there are some problems uh, of patients with the uh, vascular disease like diabetes, for example, for example, or it could be retinal disease as retinal detachment. In order to fix these conditions, we need to enter into the eye through these areas, but you need to see what you're doing. So basically, if you do have keratopigmentation done already, as I told you, there is the uh, artificial pupil, which is about 5.5 millimeters that's enough for, to perform any kind of intraocular surgery. But nevertheless, if we do have any pathology in the eye, which will require sequential treatments, we rather avoid keratopigmentation, at least for this time, or maybe even forever. Okay, I wanna describe you two cases of absolute contraindication. One would be uh, penetrating keratoplasty, when the surgery was done to replace major part of the cornea with the donor cornea. And that would be the, uh, the reason for this, as for the second one, which is radial keratotomy, it's because the cuts done almost 90% of depth of the cornea. So the channel will cross sect that and will create the possible opening of the, of, the, um, of the cornea, which will basically lose the content of the eye. That's absolute contraindication for keratopigmentation. So if you did have keratotomy before or penetrating keratoplasty, that's as, as I told you before, it's absolute contraindication for keratopigmentation change of the color of the eye with this method. That concludes our series about absolute and relative contraindication for keratopigmentation to change the color of your eyes. If you're interested in more information and to get in contact with us, please visit our website keratonyc.com. Thank you very much.